Hola todo el mundo. I am Lewis Denham Parry from um, Control Plane, and I'm going to give a light speed introduction to threat modeling Kubernetes. Um, as I say, you may know me as the um, head of training at Control Plane. However, um, the fact that this is a light speed talk is going to be very beneficial because I'm going to pitch to you all my crazy, amazing new idea. Um, for an adventuring cloud native today, which is called, um, very imaginatively, Control Flame. What is this well thought out, well considered idea I hear you say? Um, Control Flame is all based on the fact that I run um, Capture the Flags for a living. I love running Capture the Flags at KubeCon for wonderful people like yourself. However, what this means is I've become very good at breaking clusters and I've forgotten everything I used to know about fixing them. So Control Flame is my wonderful idea where I will go all over the world. L Lewis. Uh, what, what, what are you doing? I, I, I didn't think you'd be here. No, I wasn't. I just woke up somewhere and I didn't have my lanyard. Um, I don't know what's really oh. happening right now. Um, this one. But why are you speaking? Why, why are you talking about Control I, I, Flame? I, I, I'm pitching. You're pitching? Yeah. But uh, how did we get to this spot? I'm so glad you asked. I thought okay. you never would. So, remember dinner last night? Not really. Like, you see this dastardly character at the back? You were, you were a bit suspicious yesterday. He was the man who handed you your eighth glass of wine. And the first to the seventh as well. So and the that, first seven. That probably explains the ditch, yeah. Well, this was the start of the night. This was the end of the night. Ah, uh, but okay. So, that's our first threat model. We can't really trust you. Um, yes. But thank you, James. Um, so first of all, we want to talk about identity in that some of you might not have known who I am. Um, hi, I'm Lewis Sennon Parry. Um, first of all, thank you to James Callaghan. Um, actually. For the remainder of this talk, I will be James Callaghan as well. Um, so James is a security architect at Control Plane. Um, he helped create uh, this workshop. So this uh, initially was a workshop that we deliver on threat modeling uh, Kubernetes. So, hi everyone, I'm the real Lewis. Um, I don't know how to prove it to you right now, but I am the head of training at Control Plane. So, when I take a stage, I like to take the opportunity to talk about mental health. Um, I'll just say this for a moment. I do suffer from depression, um, and I know I'm not the only one who does. Um, at times, this conference has felt o overwhelming. Um, the last couple of years, having virtual conferences have had their own problems. Being in a room filled with people, seeing so many people all at once, it's been overwhelming, but it's been so good to see familiar faces from days gone by, but equally making some new ones as well. Making some new faces, some new friendly faces. Um, but to the point of depression, if you do suffer from it, you're not alone. Like, I'm, my DMs are always open, but equally, I'm sure there are so many people around you who think you're awesome. Um, and equally, I think this is now going to be called the KubeCon, where everyone found out how tall we are. Um, so, like, for the last two years, I did not know many of my colleagues and their height. Now, the other caveat to this talk is that it's always learning. I am forever learning, and I'm happy with that. The terms that I'm using today are the terms that I know of. Um, I, and equally, to the open source maintainers that we have in this room, if we're talking about technologies, I absolutely appreciate the time and the effort that, you've done, uh, that, you, that you put into writing, maintaining, and contributing to open source. So if anything is derogative towards anything there, it is not that. I'm just talking from an attacking perspective. And equally saying attacking. Um, sometimes when given talks, some people find that too aggressive. Um, I'm still like, trying to figure out the right terminologies and so forth. But if I do offend you in any way, please just give me a shout out. Um, just drop me a message and um, yes, I will continue to learn. But to that, we're here to talk about threat modeling. So what is threat modeling? Threat modeling is identifying, enumerating threats and vulnerabilities. It's devising mitigations and it's prioritizing uh, residual risks. And we want to escalate the most important things. So you should try to build the first version of a threat model without any, side, out, any outsider influence. Then you can pull in external resources to cross-check um, the group's uh, thinking. Threat modeling can be performed at any stage of the project, but to quote the Smiths, how soon is now? The sooner that you get it started, the better. And this isn't a shift somewhere from a security team to someone else. This is, for me, is about being a decent human being and respecting other people's information and lives. And we'll talk more about that during this talk. 
So that point, this allows us to have um, diversity, which I hope I've spelt correctly at this moment in time. Threat modeling should bring everyone together. Everyone's got a voice and everyone should be heard. Race, gender, age, all the shapes and sizes, everyone should be at the table for this. Um, within your organization, it should be development, it should be operations, QA, product, business stakeholders, security. Equally, if you're in your own building, talk to the security guards, talk to the people who are cooking the food. Like, have you ever thought about what might happen if someone poisons a whole staff? Now, did anyone here take part in the CTF over Monday and Tuesday? If you could raise a hand, I can see a couple. It's, I, can, I recognize some familiar faces. Thank you ever so much for joining. Thank you for the feedback. It's been that was almost a swear word. I hope that's not a swear word in Spanish. Um, now, I don't think I can remember saying this, and I don't really know where it came from, but my point is that I felt comfortable to share this. So you are, not, you are stupid if you assume I'll remember you asking what you think is a stupid question. I remember the first time I went into a threat model, I felt like I was asking the most stupid questions. But like I said, if your voice is not being heard, then that's just a stupid assumption. Equally, back to mental health right here. So Ian is in the room today. Um, Ian, um, Smarticus, and uh, Moet as well, so Skybound. Um, they both did super awesome at the CTFs. And speaking to them, like, I don't think much of myself. I see the best in everyone else. And I've learned that if the people that I look up to and respect, respect me, then that's something I should be proud of. So thank you to Ian for doing this tweet. It gives me the motivation to stand up on stage today. So we're going to be going through these four steps throughout this talk. We are going to talk what, about what we are building. We're going to talk about what can go wrong once it's built. What are we going to do about the things that can go wrong? And are we doing a good, a good job? It'd be good if I could pronounce it good the first time round. <laughs> um, are we doing a good job or, of analysis? If you came to KubeCon and I have to present this talk, um, then I have to run back to the office next week. Sorry, what I'm trying to say here is, if you've come to KubeCon and work has said to you, you need to present something when you come back from, from KubeCon because we sent you all this way, why not do a threat model? Why not do a brown bag session at lunch and bring a team around and try to figure out the risks that you might have on your projects? And that's what I'm hoping to do today with this talk, is to put you into a position where you feel comfortable to be able to do that. So what are we building? Um, here today, I'm, I've got an assumption here that you already have an understanding of Kubernetes, and we're going to be focusing more about the threat modeling here. But, so we're going to learn more about threat modeling during this talk. If you do have questions, then please come at the end and we can discuss them. Also, I'll be here all day tomorrow and all, all, day, tomorrow, all day tonight, and I'll be here tomorrow and I'm more than happy to talk with you. So, documenting your system. Your business is not my business. You might be a large multi-scale corporation that's existed since what I think of as the dawn of time. Equally, you might just be a startup and you might have just met your co-founder five minutes coming down on the escalator outside um, coming into this talk. Not all businesses are the same shape and size, so the threats are gonna be different. So what type of damage can be inflicted? Well, when we get attacked, there might be reputational damage, or there might be financial loss. Now, threats represent potential ways that information assets can be attacked. So let's use an information, of, um, an information asset. So is anyone in this room willing to shout out their credit card number to me now? Uh, does anyone? So quiet. <laughs> so I don't think anyone wants to shout out their credit card information because it's going to be uh, transmitted. It's, the network across here, everyone's going to hear that credit card, and it's going to be there. Equally, I'm probably just going to write it on, in a note on my phone, and the storage of that isn't ideal because it's just going to be in plain text. So we've got issues there about confidentiality. So we've got the CVV, uh, of the CVV digits of the credit card. We need that to stay confidential. Now, we also have integrity. So integrity is about if someone goes to make a payment and I'm trying to say, I'm going to pay James for coming up on stage and I'm going to give him five euro. Now, Andy, the CEO of Control Plane, he's still trying to get more money out. So then he decides that this money is going to go to his account. So the integrity there is, is that I think I'm doing some, I think I'm paying James, but actually it's going elsewhere. And finally, we have availability. So availability is being able to have a service available to me to be able to process this transaction. So there should be a scheme in place for how important the information is. So how much money can you lose as an organization? So as an organization, if you're a startup and you're literally counting your pennies, like you put all into coming to KubeCon to keep going for the next, for the next year, 
then maybe you're not too concerned. If it's a free service that you're offering people, then it's probably like, well, you only live once, we just gotta get, we gotta get through to the next day. Whereas if you're a multinational company, um, you might be willing to lose money. It might be a lot cheaper for you just to lose money than it is to pay for a new team to fix an issue. But let's also, instead of talking about money for a second, let's talk about customer data. If it is a free service, then you might be willing to say that, well, I'm losing all this data because it's a free service at the end of the day and I'm just going to burn down this company. But if you're a company that's dealing with people's life savings and then you lose someone's um, information or it becomes available online, then the integrity of your business just disappears straight away. And then all of a sudden, that's going to be a huge cost to you. But away from those two points, there's also something else. There's a loss of life at risk here. So we've all got personal secrets. And depending on where you live, then it might be personal for a reason. It might be that the political system or for religious beliefs, you can't share some of this information. But you might have reached out to someone online to be able to talk to them and feel, comfortable, feel part of the community. If that information gets out, what might happen to that person? Equally, if we've got personal identifiable information, as we've seen with Strava graphs previously and so forth, you might be able to identify where people are, where people live. And we've seen problems like that happen before. So I hope I have your attention when I say to you how important it is that we deal with data and how, if someone trusts us with their data, that we look after it. Now we've got an adversary matrix here. So these are the people who might potentially, or the actors, that might potentially look at um, attacking your system. So we start off at the top on the left with a script kiddie. So anyone in this room, when they're at school, did they ever try to play Quake or Doom on their school network? Okay, there we go, as always gets the hands up. So these are people who like watch YouTube videos and like try to figure out how to hack. Um, and their motivation might just be, they're just trying to see what's happening. They're just trying to learn. They might also then grow into a motivated individual. So this could be someone who's got a competing startup to you and they want to inflict damage on your business. Um, it could be someone that you've annoyed because you didn't recognize them first time around at a conference and they want to inflict damage on you. Or they just plain don't like you. Now to that, I would like to introduce you to Freddy. <laughs> Freddy is the nicest person I know. He is phenomenal. And if you give him a follow, those two things, they do so well online. And they do this on capture, uh, capture of flag events. You'll see them hacking away on YouTube and so forth. Follow Freddy, and then you're gonna learn more about the techniques that those people might use. So from there, we're gonna to look towards insiders. So this is someone inside um, your organization. So instead of having someone who's out, outside of your organization and frustrated with you, they've somehow found them their way inside. So this could be a disgruntled employee. They might have just seen a spreadsheet with people's salaries, and then they've seen that they've, they're earning, say, 40% less than everyone else, and they want to take it out on the business. Now, we'll come back to this in a little bit again, but then that also leads on to organized crime. So in organized crime, you can think of this as a business because they're just trying to exfiltrate money and they're going to go for key individuals. So and this comes back to COVID. For the last two years, we've been sharing lots of personal information online and depending on our threat model, how open we've been about it, but it's a way for us to find our communities again when we've been locked away from each other. Can these opportunities allow people to identify pe uh, people that might be in an organization that they could look to leverage? And right now, at this moment, you might, like, you might think to yourself, I'm so happy in my job. I've got the perfect job in the world and everything's rosy. But what happens when, say, a family member gets a medical bill and they can't cover it and they come to you asking and there's this huge bill and then you've got to find that money overnight? If someone comes waving this money towards you just to give them some credentials, some access to this, something as simple as that, would you be willing to give them access to that? And could that be someone else next to you? And again, I know this sounds like far-fetched, but I was trying to figure out just a moment ago, I think I've lived through two or three recessions now, possibly four soon. Um, I've lived through a pandemic, I've lived through a volcano erupting that blocked air travel, and I've lived through a Leicester City winning the Premiership. Tell me that 10 years ago, and I would have just said, no way, but that's where we are. Now, to get some user involvement, um, I've devised some games today. So the first game I've got is called The Apprentice. So prior to you all coming in today, um, underneath the seats, I've put two post-it notes. So someone's got a post-it note with game 00 written on it. So if you look underneath your seats, and I'm hoping you're sat on one of the seats that has a post-it note.
We've got one over there. All right. So would you mind just reading what's on your post-it note? Yep, so just for the people who might be watching online, um, if I just make sure I get it right, you're a C-level exec. Um, someone's emailed you your password, and they've said that they've got a webcam video of you from your laptop. So all of a sudden, you're probably now thinking, well, I don't want that video to be online, so that someone's got leverage over you at this moment in time. So that's an example as to what can happen in an organization. Think of LinkedIn. As an attacker, I can just search for C-level execs of these business. I can have a look. I can look into your company's documents. I can see how much you're trading. I can target you that way. At this point, not everyone's techie. Educate your team. I think we've all seen those emails before that show us that password. We're all here probably nodding, saying, well, yes, I know about have I been pwned. I know straight away that that was from a data breach from someone a while ago. But if you're a C-level exec, you don't. And equally, they're targeting the emotions there. So again, educate your staff, make sure that they're aware of this, and look towards password managers as well. So to go back to this, we've got our cloud, uh, cloud service insider. So we're building up on dependencies now as well. So when we looked inside our organization and the people around us, what about the people that we're dependent on? So you're running Kubernetes, so I'm, presum I'm presuming that a lot of you are running stuff in a cloud. The cloud is real. So even though we talk about it being rented to compute, you can go and touch a compute somewhere in this world, and that's where your workloads are running. Do you trust an individual who's got access to that? Is your organization a bank where you need to know that someone can't touch that server unless they've got certain, certain clearance? And the reason why we need to do that is for the next one. So I don't think you need to do this again, but there was another post-it note in this room. And so if you had the other post-it note, would you mind standing up? Cool. We've got one over here. So would you mind just sharing what yours says? It's a pleasure to meet you. So, <laughs> so um, they just mentioned that they work, uh, sorry, they are part of a government agency with unlimited funds towards offensive security. Oh, this was part of the game, sorry. Who's sat next to me anyway? Um, that, so that government could even create a new identity for you. So when you go to get your job, when they go to get the job, they could create a brand new identity. They can make that person look as they want to. And with the unlimited funds that they have there, then it's all of a sudden it's a different kind of threat. So here's an example of a section of a data flow diagram that we used in our full workshop. Um, a data flow diagram should describe the complete set of data. It should show our trust boundaries. It should show all user roles, all network interfaces. And we should make this self-contained. And the most important thing out of all those things is, is that we make it accurate. If it's not accurate, then it's worthless. To make this easier for others to consume and contribute towards, we can have a high-level overview. Again, we want to bring as many people as possible to this. And um, remember, well, we can then delve deeper into this. We can deeper levels going into further abstractions. But at this point, just remember to drop the ladder. An assumption that you make, because it's something that you've done for the last five years, the, per the junior or someone else, or whoever it may be, it doesn't even have to be a junior. Someone who's coming on who doesn't have that knowledge that you do, they need to be able to pick this up and understand what's happening. So this is an example of the CNCF Financial Services User Group, uh, the Kubernetes Data Flow Diagram. So we've identified state flow with the black lines in this. Um, the black arrows are crossing the machine segregation between nodes as seen with the green boundaries. There's a lot of information here, but if you want to learn more about it, then um, we've got access uh, to the CNCF uh, repo there. So how can attacker look for an entry point? Um, publicly available information is the easiest route in. So Rory is someone, again, who I, I have the utmost respect for in the industry, and I look towards for this. And so we've got a fantastic blog post um, about finding publicly accessible clusters. And you might think to yourself, well, I've been running clusters for so long now, why would someone make it publicly accessible? Well, from the keynotes, we've heard about how many new people are still coming into Kubernetes. This is day one for Kubernetes. Someone's starting up their journey again, and I can attest that I learned by making mistakes. And so other people will potentially be making these mistakes. And this is why we need a threat model. We need to understand what we're making available. So what can go wrong? Um, and with the alignment of this header, we can see a great example of things that can go wrong. This is where your experience is required. Has anyone ever heard of a term secret source that is used with your products? 
Now, the secret sauce is something that isn't, if it isn't very secret anymore, is that going to cause you issues? We can also use threat and intelligent sources such as uh, these to help and guide us. And lots of, uh, lots of people have collated information to help us with this. As with everything cloud native, we stand on the shoulders of giants, and we really appreciate that. Um, and these techniques give us a starting point. From there, we can use modeling techniques such as stride and attack trees to go into further detail. Now, to give an example, um, we're going to use the Microsoft uh, threat matrix for Kubernetes. Now, I'm not going to go through each of these, but the highlight that I'd like to make you aware of is the red and the green. So the red shows deprecated techniques, and the green shows new techniques. Now, the reason I'm saying this is because Kubernetes is constantly evolving. We've seen the four-month release schedule for it. This is ever-changing. So if that's evolving, we need to evolve our threat models with it, too. Stride. Now, I can never remember the acronym for Stride, but um, for each, um, we need to stride for process, for data flow, um, for store, and for actor. And we need to identify what might, might go wrong. So with Stride, um, Stride um, spoofing, pretending to be something or someone who you're not. So James did this perfectly at the start of his talk uh, by pretending to be me. Tampering. So back to the banking example. Um, when we talked about um, I was trying to pay uh, James five euros, Andy took that request, he modified it so that Andy got paid five euros. That's tampering in action. Repudiation. So this is when we just assume business is happening as usual. If Andy did that in transit, then I would not necessarily be aware that Andy has changed um, the bank account. I'm assuming I've paid James. So if James hasn't been paid, how do I know that Andy's taken the money? And equally, if I say to Andy, Andy, you took my five euros, how, do, how can he how, he'd say, no, 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 I haven't. How can I prove it? Oh, hey, Andy. <laughs> right, and so we've got I for information disclosure. Um, this is exposing information of people who aren't authorized to see it. So this was the example of a credit card, CVV information. No one's willing in this room to give me their credit card number. So I think you need to trust that if you're taking anyone's credit card number, I think you should treat them the same. So D for denial of service. Um, at this point, it feels like I'm probably DDoSing you with the amount of information I'm giving you. But if you've got a publicly accessible API, then someone could DDoS that account um, and take your, um, say, the API offline, so then the administrator of a cluster can no longer manage their workloads. Then we've got elevation of privilege, and James again did this perfectly. He went from having a speaker lanyard to having a, uh, sorry, a sponsor lanyard to a speaker lanyard, and then he was able to get, get up on stage and tell you what he wanted to say. So we build from Strider and we visualize with attack trees. This helps to identify risks to our resources and the likelihood of them happening. We don't want to have too much information in this instance, so please focus on the quality and not the quantity at this stage, and be confident to deliver concise documentation. Now, in this example, we use a delivery person who has taken a sensitive document from building A to building B to be stored in a locker. So to compare this to Kubernetes, uh, people would be equal to our workloads, our roads is equal to networking, buildings would be equal to storage, and our security guards are equal to the control plane. So you can see from the color coding here, at the top, um, our top node is an, uh, an OR node, and we also have an AND node. So for the example of that, the blue AND node reads steal from locker. So the AND node means that the two children nodes of the AND node need to be accomplished to be able to access. So this needs to be both the child nodes, so the key to the locker and entry to the building. Now, now Kelly Shortridge has uh, shown us how to use graph, fields, graph viz, sorry, to build attack trees. Deciduous is another option available to code an attack tree, and we have also created an example available in our Git repo listed here. These slides will be available afterwards. So let's have a look at what can go wrong within Kubernetes. So this is our game, uh, Game02, Wheel of Misfortune. So I've kindly asked James Munley if he would mind playing Wheel of Misfortune. So James, have you ever played Wheel of Fortune before, or Misfortune? You, ha you have not. Okay, so could you give me a letter, please? V. There is no V. Could you give me another letter, please? That is not V. R. Okay, so we got R. A. We got A. B. All right, I think it's a point. Can anyone guess what this uh, Kubernetes? Uh, what could go wrong with Kubernetes here? Does anyone have a clue? Pardon? 
are back. Yeah, are back. Misconfiguration, misconfiguratee. <laughs> so, this was a great idea that happened a couple of hours ago, and we invested a lot of time and effort into getting to this stage. If you've ever tried to create this, oh, geez. So um, we had to make a quick decision. Do we continue with this or do we scrap it? So we fixed it and we've um, added configuration onto it. So what can go wrong with Kubernetes? Well, we've got workloads. So this is our parts. We could have a rice within there. We could have a reverse code executable in there. It could be a container breakout. So if you did the um, CTF on Monday, we showed you how to break out of a privileged container. It could be file systems, host mounts, hostile containers runtimes, pod configuration, pod security context, and service accounts. And there's networking. So we've got intra-pod net, intra -pod network. So it's pods communicating with each other. So with something in a control plane being able to com communicate with something in a default and vice versa. Interpod, so we've got our own network within the pod. So what about the containers within the same pod? We don't have any workload identity by default, and we don't have network policy by default. So storage, what about attacking volumes? We have the dangers of the host mounts, again shown in the CTF. And equally, what happens if we have no encryption at rest? So if we're perceiving that where we're storing our state, what happens if SED isn't encrypted? What happens if um, our persistent storage isn't encrypted? And then also with our IAM policies. So can we pivot to attack on the cloud APIs? Can we pivot to attack the Kubernetes API? And can we exploit app workflows? So in summary, what can go wrong? Lots. And this is overwhelming, I understand that. But the most important thing that you can do is just try it. You start with, you put your best foot forward and you keep pushing forward. Now this is only a small subsection of the attack tree and we can review these attacks to, show, to see how uh, they will be scoped. Do our attackers have access to the resources that can enable them? And this, equally, this, um, this is available on the Threat Modeling Labs repo as well. So what are we going to do about it? Absolutely nothing. We can do absolutely nothing about it. And that's what's going to happen if you're not doing threat modeling, because you're not aware of this. Equally, when you do become aware of it, then you might say, well, we don't need to do anything about it. But it's important to become aware of the risks, and then you determine that with your own threat model. Now, we have all performed our own personal threat model. In Kubernetes, in Kubernetes, that's not our company name, we're Control Plane, which is equally difficult when you work with Kubernetes. In our company, Control Plane, we've been discussing about our um, personal threat mo model during COVID, because everyone's been affected differently. For whatever reason, we all have to make different choices. We've all decided to come out to Valencia and come to this, and there's people who are at home, maybe watching this, who might have decided not to. In doing all that, you had to make, you identified the risks and you identified if it was worth you coming. So when we talk about threat modeling, don't think of it as a scary buzzword. Now, with shared responsibility model, um, equally depending on where we run our Kubernetes cluster, if we are running it in the cloud and we're using a hosted service and they're managing our control plane for us, then maybe we don't, we don't have to worry about the control plane. That's being managed, that's being someone else to handle. Whereas if, you, uh, if you're running your own Kubernetes, um, then you do need to then consider about uh, man uh, managing the security of your control plane. So risk management. So if in, in the case of a void, just think of Marie Kondo, um, and if it doesn't bring you any joy whatsoever, just throw it away. Like, just get rid of it if you want to avoid it. Now, if it is bringing you joy, if you do require to run it, then uh, we can mitigate this, but that means that you need to make it better, and you make it better until it brings you to a position where it brings you joy. You can accept it, which is just to do nothing. It's meh. You, and that's fine. This is your risk. This is your decision. Or you can transfer this. So you could just pass it to legal or to your insurers, and then you can give them joy in doing whatever it is that they do. <laughs> now, um, we can do things. We can be preventative. So um, preventative is about shifting our knowledge. Now, we talk about shift left. Um, if you've got developers who are just committing some YAML in or some um, infrastructure people, we can use tools like CubeSec or OPA. And then with these tools, we can then review our workloads as an emission controller. But not just deny, not just to say you can't run this workload. Help educate people at this stage. Help give them a reason as to why they shouldn't be doing this. Because if they can understand why they shouldn't be doing it, then that gives you growth. That gives you growth within your business. So we can be a detective, so we can export and monitor logs. So tools like Cilium and Falco are great at doing this.
um, corrective. So if <laughs> we can have a corrective approach, so this could just be a big red button on your desk. If something doesn't feel right, if you want to cut everything out, you can literally just pull the plug out of it and hit this button. That gives you the confidence to do it. And this is a shout out to old school as well. Now, in training with Kubernetes, I see there's lots of patterns that get repeated over and over again. But equally, I see patterns that die off and are no longer available. So it's to in ensure that you base your decisions on technologies and concepts that we still use today. Don't necessarily use the old ones instead. Kubernetes and Cloud IAM is at the center of cloud native security. So review, review your permissions regularly. Um, user management processes are key. So review onboarding and offboarding processes, so joiners, movers, and leavers, or JML. Implement strong access controls and policies. Default Kubernetes service accounts should not be used. Create a dedicated service account for every workload. Is your workload identity. And workloads will interact with Kubernetes API or the cloud via workload identity integration. Cloud, provide, cloud provider services can help. So IAM roles for service accounts in AWS or workload identity in GKE. The IRSA uses service account token volume projections, and this is one benefit of using a managed offering. For crypt cryptographically strong workload identities, Spire can be used, and Spire is a production-ready implementation of Spiffy's APIs. So look towards the least privileged parts. Always look at least privileged. Make sure that you can't run things that you don't want to be able to in, within your pods. Review what the workloads are when they're being submitted, and use IDS to report suspicious behavior where possible. And use automated security testing within your pipelines. So I don't know if anyone else has spoken about supply chain at KubeCon right yet. So um, to save a bit of time, this is my hot take. Um, I would, I would employ, um, at Six Store, if there's Luke Hines. Um, I've had the pleasure of chatting to Luke. He is such a good person, and I'm so excited to see what happens next and what the future holds with Six Store, and I'm sure it's going to be awesome. Um, equally as that, to that, there is uh, Jed and Adrian at ChainGuard, and I'm expecting to see amazing things there as well, for sure. So please look towards those talks around this conference. In regards to networking, um, go chat to Natalia at iSurveillant. Um, we've been working together on the CTF, and the tools that they're open sourcing this week are phenomenal and really exciting to look at. But with this as well, um, on day one, look towards network policies and such. Make sure that um, only things can communicate to each other that you want to be able to communicate to each other. So manage your secrets with whatever works for you. Don't just go for a big name, just whatever you feel comfortable with, whatever is right for you, make sure it's just implemented correctly. Um, use a mission control to, to have context as to what's being shared, and no one should be able to read uh, what's in my volume, and no one should be able to uh, get out what's in my volume. So we have controls for the security requirements. Um, I'm giving this talk at the moment, and you're living in real life. Everything that I'm probably saying is you might just say to you, well, that's great, you're on stage just talking about this. I understand. Our businesses make decisions which sometimes we don't understand ourselves, and we have to work with that. But again, like I said, we're all human beings. We just need to do the best job that we can with what we're given. Prioritize the risk and do what you can do. So did we do a good job? Um, I've heard this possibly several times in my career now that I've done a good job. But it's important to make sure that we're confident that we've achieved what we've set out to do. And look towards other people as well to help you identify this. So it's important to look back as well as looking forward. Have we achieved what we have set out to do? Look to others for their reviews. Is this something that you've missed out? There's testing, testing, and testing. And we'll talk about testing with security in a moment. And as time moves on, our acceptable level may change. So what I mean by that is document the decisions that you make today. The decisions that you make today is with the information that you have available to you right now. If someone reviews that in a week's time, then the information that they're using to make that decision is different. So if you document exactly the reasons why you've done this, it gives a fighting chance in the future to understand why we've implemented things. Um, select security controls for implementation. So map these controls to our attack tree. So when we've identified in our attack tree a possible route, then we look at the controls that can mitigate this for us. This provides us a direct means of evaluating our effectiveness. Visual rep representations are easier to reason about. So identify how many nodes and branches of the attack tree are covered by mitigating these controls. This assesses the resulting security of a system. So enough security controls are defined. Any new attacks added to the tree should be mitigated by existing controls. 
So if you look within the Git repo that we have, um, you'll find an example of us using GOST to test out a secur security requirement of a cluster. So in this, um, we uh, did a demonstration of a pod security policy. And so as we change the version of our Kubernetes cluster, and pod security policies are no, no longer in place, our control is no longer there for our security requirement. So our test fails when we upgrade our cluster. But that's great for us, because that tells us that our security requirement is no longer controlled. And that bit, when we have that failed test, we know we need to review that. It equally allows your team to, um, develop, uh, to deliver and contribute code with confidence. So I got this far into the talk without talking about whales. Um, I'm very proud of where I've come from, and I feel you should be proud of where you've come from too. Um, when I grew up, I couldn't really identify with anyone, and I didn't know where I was going in my life. Um, so being able to be a bit like, confident in myself, I tried to leave the way forward so that others can follow if they so wish. Now, we also have castles in Wales. Now, castles are the OGs of threat modeling in my mind. If you ever feel like you have to walk around a castle, just think of all the ideas that they had to um, prevent people from attacking. But at this point, um, I thought there was a song by a Welsh band, which is a good way to leave this talk. So there's a band called The Stereophonics with a song called A Thousand Trees, with a link to it there. But I've changed it to It Only Takes One Project to Identify A Thousand Threats, and It Only Takes One Threat to Burn A Thousand Projects. And finally, um, just remember your own voice. Um, I've been trying to say today that your voice is so important that you share, and you share these ideas that you have. Today, or well, this morning, there's a Twitter thread. So has anyone had issues with taxis in Valencia? Ha has anyone been in a taxi in Valencia? OK, has anyone been in a taxi on a roundabout in Valencia? <laughs> like, like, <laughs> exactly. So. It's a bit worrying, but I mentioned on the first day I got here, I just started talking to my taxi driver. And I became friends with my taxi driver, and we shared numbers. And so every morning at 8 AM, my taxi driver and I, he picks me up. And I'm getting as much swag for his children. We had a FaceTime with my daughter on the way in this morning. It was um, probably too much information. But to that, Rory, who I mentioned earlier on, who I absolutely I look towards, um, Rory replied with, now that, that is good thinking. So that's an example today where something that I just thought was so obvious to do is uh, for other people you might not necessarily see. So I hope you can leave here that feeling that we can all contribute, and please feel free to empower others around you as well. So to that, I thank you for your time. Enjoy your KubeCon, and enjoy the party.